lunch, Lady Doris. Have you got any grease? Yes. Yes, we do. Then grease me up, woman! Hey folks, this is Grease Cosman. Welcome to the final segment in the Boneworks story and lore guide. As always, here is a massive spoiler warning off-ramp for anyone unfamiliar with the secrets of Duck Season and the general story of Boneworks. Part 1 laid the foundations for the key concepts of the Boneworks universe, such as the Voidway, Monogon Industries, MythOS, Gammon, Saber Lake, SCP Field Codes, and Curve Light Technology. Part 2 defined the Boneworks and its relationship with MythOS and the Voidway. The NPCs and enemy interactions were also detailed. The key themes of death and immortality, as well as a subplot of emancipation for the growingly sentient nullbody population, was also introduced. Moreover, the critical concept that multiple Fords exist in the Boneworks universe, to varying degrees, was revealed. Some of these Fords appear to be behind the warning messages found throughout the game. Finally, Melon Belly and its sweeping influence throughout Boneworks was also covered, so it is highly recommended to pause and watch the earlier segments before continuing. I again want to express my deepest thanks and credit to the Boneworks lore community for helping to hash out ideas. As with the first two videos in this series, these videos would not have been possible without their input. Finally, I echo my appreciation once more for the Boneworks universe created by Stress Level Zero and its lore author, Alex Knoll. As mentioned in Part 2, Alex has a concern that the hints he provides in the Bone Lore Discord channel may be taken out of context. Since video does not convey the full context of the conversations I may show within this guide, please understand that anything I present as a hint or even a confirmation from Alex is my own interpretation. Given that Alex often drops hints in a playful or oblique way, you're at the mercy of my ability to decrypt his statements. Part 2 left off with covering all of the NPCs and their interactions. Let us finally return to Ford's journey as he nears the end of runoff. I also want to make clear that almost all of the following details are my own speculations, as the consensus documentation and the SLZ Discord discussion does not tend to dive deeply into these details. As such, I take full responsibility if I end up driving the lore trolley off the rails from this point forward. At the end of runoff, observant players may have noticed a vague purple entity floating in the sky just before the trash wheel. This is the first known sighting of what I will label Void Ford. Much more on this entity will be said later. Being a Volter construction and not intended to be traversed by the average user, the sewers do not have force fields and quarantine barriers to block the way. Instead, the area has been infested with corrupted null bodies and zombie fords. A few non-corrupted null bodies exist at the very outset of the level, or, interestingly, have been locked away in jail cells. Within the sewers, Ford receives his first communication from another Monagon employee, encryption specialist Alora. You're heading to the tower to reset. <laughs> I've been obsessing over the possibility for weeks and you acted on it first. I couldn't let you think you were the only one who saw it. Just leave a way for others to get in. That's all I'm asking for our contributions. Leave a way in. Unlike Hayes, Alora seems to have some idea of what Arthur Ford is doing. The lore consensus here believes that Alora is not aware that Ford is attempting immortality. However, my view is that she understands its potential to convey immortality, but it's unclear if she fully realizes what that journey will require. First, she's been obsessing over the possibility for weeks, and is miffed that Arthur beat her to the punch. She also drops a hint that she even knows of a security vulnerability that Ford is exploiting. She speaks of heading to the tower for clock reset, tipping off that she's figured out the very mechanism required to execute Ford's plan. Recall the break room message where Ford wonders if the Monogon heads knew even remotely how valuable this is. This suggests that the method of clock reset as a way to disconnect the resurrection field outside MythOS chambers is not an obvious flaw. It would take someone with a proper technical background to recognize it. Alora, clearly in a show of competition, mentions she didn't want Ford to think that he was the only one who saw it. Further, recall the conversation from the Duck Season clipboard between Hayes and Ford. They are specifically talking about Gammon's access to the Voidway and how they aren't securing the pathways. This fact leads forward to the very security vulnerability that sparks the events of Boneworks. However, as an encryption specialist of the Boneworks project, Alora would understand the implications of an unsecured pathway and the vulnerability Ford discovered. In other words, she's caught on to what he's doing. Her only request? Leave a way for others to get in. For our contributions. It's unclear what these contributions are, 
but it offers further weight in my mind that Alora is, at the very least, aware of most of Ford's plans. The sewer level also contains the most elaborate melon belly distillation operation in the game, and we find the most populated collection of corrupted nulls among the machinery. Sewers also introduces a variant of the zombie Ford that can shoot blue projectiles from its hand. The only other enemy to make an appearance are the Monogon Crablets that ambush Ford in the Purple Key Room. I'll note that they enter through a path entirely separate from the other enemies in the room, and other sightings are toward the end of the level, where, similar to Runoff, Boneworks establishes a theme where enemies featured in the next level tend to spill into the ending of the current one. In my mind, this gives a sense that the melon belly corruption within MythOS is spreading, and Monogon is losing its battle to contain it. Across from the Purple Key and Crablet Ambush Room, the February game update added a Boneworks box with the red and blue gym prism near the two locked void doors. While these doors were accessible before, their surroundings have been retouched with a more ominous void presence. Alex from Stress Level Zero has specifically slated these doorways for future content. For now, while dev tools can bypass the grating and the doors can be opened, not much else can be accomplished in this area. Yet. The sewers dumps Ford into the warehouse where Omni projectors have staged a defensive perimeter around a lone working train that provides access to Central Station. At the outset of the level, Hayes reaches out and shares what the outside world is piecing together about the disruption in MythOS. You learn that Monogon still doesn't know Ford was behind the breach, and you also get confirmation from Hayes that Saber Lake security agents are performing the investigation. As in sewers, Monogon Crablets attempt to ambush Ford, though this trap can be avoided if the warehouse is entered by unconventional means. Near the end of the level, we get more indications that the melon belly corruption has spread beyond the sewers as a cluster of corrupted nulls press the Omni Projector defensive line. When our Ford arrives at the central station, it becomes clear that a zombie Ford influence has overrun the level, as only Monogon Crablets and automated turrets remain as Monogon defensive measures for the station. At least until you reach the instance portal at the end of the level, where a lone Omni Projector, the first seen since the showdown at the warehouse, spills in from the tower instance. All null bodies in the station have been corrupted by the melon belly operation that's tucked away in the recesses of the station, only accessible through the ductwork. Returning to the more civilized areas of MythOS means force fields and quarantine doors block Ford's progress once more. He also gets a warning from an increasingly nervous Alora, who states that resetting the clock will act like a beacon, allowing Saber Lake to instantly find Ford in real life. The reset is a beacon. Monogon will locate you within minutes. What can you accomplish in minutes? Unless... It is at this moment that she realizes Ford's full intent and the implications of him taking his plan all the way to fruition. Her reaction indicates that Ford's method of obtaining immortality, or at least the way in which he's going to reset the system clock, will prevent others from following in his footsteps. You aren't concerned with them finding you post-reset. Leave a way in. You can't keep this for yourself. This is all of ours. Desperate, she implores him to leave a way in. Ford is unswayed by her pleas, overrides the quarantine blockade, and pushes on to the tower. The tower serves as the Omni Projector's last stand, and they deploy massive numbers to try to end Ford's crusade to the Time Tower. However, the cleanup crew's defense is complicated by a number of roaming zombie Fords. Just before reaching the final floor of the tower, Ford stumbles upon an interesting anomaly amidst the level's mayhem. A collection of zombie Fords with headsets are enjoying a dance rave. Ford receives his penultimate contact from Hayes, who informs Arthur that Monogon has regained at least the ability to monitor operations in the Time Tower. Okay, so little update. Uh, we can see what's going on, and something is definitely controlling the Null Men. They're pulling gravity cores from the system clock, maybe to open some kind of void gate. I, I don't know, but all I know is that this is super dangerous. So good luck, man. Let's quickly revisit some of the messages in the break room, just so that they're fresh in our minds going forward. We had to code resurrection for myth, but that doesn't connect to the void. Our minds are directly connected to the void. Boneworks backend is the only thing preventing true death. What if immortality is possible? Theoretically, if we can somehow stop the system clock, we could disconnect the resurrection field outside Mythowest chambers. We could resurrect in the void. 
In order to reach the void, Arthur has stopped the system clock that undergirds MythOS. According to the writing in the break room, this has disconnected the resurrection field outside MythOS chambers. In other words, now if Ford dies outside the MythOS chamber, he'll resurrect in the void. Ford's next step is to force a system reset which will exploit the vulnerability Ford discovered in the duck season clipboard communication. Ford's intent is to resurrect his VR rig into the Boneworks backend, but how to respawn into the Boneworks and keep the MythOS resurrection code offline? Blow up or disable the MythOS system clock. Recall the Gammon USB stick inserted at the outside of the game. It specifically sabotaged the system clock. Restarting it in its damaged state will not restore MythOS to normal functions. This also explains why Alora is so freaked out by Ford's actions. She has realized the drastic measures he needs to take to complete his plan and knows the clock's destruction will ensure that no one can follow in his footsteps. This series of events is also supported in my view by the shockwave emanating from the clock sphere that wipes out all the enemies. The crumbling debris and disarray, the glitching screen seen across the walls in the time tower room after the last gravity core is inserted, the fade to white after reinserting the gravity cores, and the heartbeat sound that reverberates in Ford's ears when he spawns within the boneworks a few moments later. The system clock is a huge monstrosity and contains such immense power that it is held together by a lattice of gravity cores. If you look in the main menu map, one of the functions of the Boneworks team is to maintain time stability. I speculate that all of the colossal power of the system clock is focused on controlling the void energy pyramid found below it. Up to this point, all of the void energy sightings and leaks have looked like disorganized piles of void goop. Here though, the void matter is shaped into a perfect pyramid, suggesting the sheer power of the system clock involved in this time stabilization process. Recall that Hayes told Arthur that the Nullmen were removing gravity cores in an attempt to open some kind of void gate. If you take one of those gravity cores and hit it against an object with enough force, they activate anti-gravity tendrils and lift whatever object they have impacted. This makes me wonder if the intent of the Nullmen here is to remove enough gravity cores so that the enormous system clock sphere drops and crushes the void pyramid. Or if we take a hint from the main menu bulletin board. Perhaps removing the gravity cores will simply power down a stabilizing influence of the system clock and the void pyramid's integrity will collapse. It's unclear what mechanism the Nullmen are trying to trigger here, but they are convinced that removing cores will open a void gate. Now, if there ever was a point that I was diving off a speculation cliff in this guide, this is it. So please, dear viewer, take this whole section with a dump truck's worth of salt. Opening a void gate sounds familiar for those of us who played Duck Season and found all of its secrets. Let's come full circle and revisit the words of our favorite trickster cat, Nine. Hello, little one. 30 years waiting for someone to open a gate, and finally these fools decide to use the void way. These fools! Recall in Duck Season that Stress Level Zero earned outrage from the mysterious entity X by toying with the void way to showcase their Duck Season game. In his note, X warned the player that the showcase puzzle was a trap, and we later learned triggered the cat cryptid's release once sprung. One of the cryptids is planning on crossing a gate here. Do not complete the puzzle. The puzzle is a trap. But we can use this opportunity to stop them from bridging out. But we will need some additional help. I'm afraid this time we may have to open the boneworks. Has Nine been corrupting MythOS with Melon Belly in an effort to give rise to Null Men's sentience? so that they use a clock to open another void gate within the Boneworks universe? Moreover, Alex has specifically said that Nine is a trickster representing time, while the monkey is a trickster representing misdirection. In Duck Season, the monkey tried to influence David to miss out on exploring deeper secrets of the game. In Boneworks, it appears that Nine is influencing the null bodies to sabotage the clock to open a void gate. Recall that Nine was anticipating the arrival of others in his thank you note to David in Duck Season. There are others coming, and we must await their arrival. See you on the other side. Nine. I do not have answers, let alone good guesses here as to what Nine is referring. And Alex has made clear that we will need to wait for additional lore drops and boneworks, and perhaps even releases of future games before we have a full picture of all that is in play. It appears that Ford, perhaps inadvertently in pursuit of his immortality goal, may have prevented a void gate from being opened. Did X foresee Arthur's journey to the boneworks? and that it would put him in the time tower at this very moment? Again, all I have are questions on this subject. However, I would be wary of conflating Ford's goals of reaching the void and the Nullman's apparent goal of opening a void gate. If their objectives were one and the same, 
Ford would have just let the Nullmen complete their task and use the gate to enter the void. Let's reground ourselves and return to Ford's journey. The system clock detonates, and Ford respawns in the Boneworks back end as planned. This foreboding hallway is pulsating with void energy, and the way forward is blockaded with a door adorned with the words, Welcome Home. Its doorknob has been replaced with David's baseball from Duck Season, paw prints and all. Also in this hallway are a collection of melons and a VR headset that when examined is scribbled with nearly every discouraging message encountered in the game. In Ford's path, almost as a final plea, is a writhing, jittering specter ensconced in the purple of the void. Let us finally address this strange void entity. I believe this being represents Ford's fate if he reaches the voidway and succeeds in obtaining immortality. I also contend that these void Fords may be the authors of the endless warning messages telling Ford to turn back and avoid the void. These beings appear to be in pain, they writhe and spasm uncontrollably. They also don't seem to be able to fully materialize in the world. Getting close to them or firing a weapon at them has them whisk back from wherever they came. Undeterred, Arthur Ford smashes through the barricaded door and drops into a void-colored instance portal. I speculate this differently colored portal is intended to denote traveling between a Boneworks instance point rather than a MythOS instance gate. Throughout this guide, as a shorthand, I've often used MythOS to refer to MythOS City. However, the events that are now unfolding will be best understood if I use distinct terms for MythOS and MythOS City going forward. It may be useful to think of Fantasyland as a separate application for MythOS City, but both Fantasyland and MythOS City run on the same void-powered myth operating system. This distinction is not very clear throughout the game, but since MythOS computers are still running in the antechamber behind the throne room, and you can still be contacted by the real-world Monogon employees, it's safe to say that while we have left the MythOS City simulation, Ford is still in MythOS. The cutscene that follows Ford's dive into the void-colored instance gate reveals that Ford's virtual self appears to have taken over at this level of immersion and force grabbing the crowbar that was left by real-life Ford earlier indicates this separation. Though it's unclear at this point if this is a complete disconnection from the real world. Ford arrives in the dungeon of Fantasyland. Here we are introduced to the husk Fords created from prior iterations of Ford's success. As mentioned earlier when covering the different NPC types, Melon Belly has a small influence here. Yet without a Melon Belly operation, progress of these Fords to gain further sentience appears to be stunted. They require mimicking our Ford's actions before being able to walk or use complex arm gestures. Ford exploits this mimicry to escape his cell and exit the dungeon to the arena. In the arena, Ford is pitted against a series of challenges in order to earn an audience with the king. Outside the castle, two towering statues depict dramatic circumstances. To me, one statue with outstretched, almost reverend-like hands appears to represent Monogon's false promise, with the people cheering and reaching for their idol. The other statue depicts the reality. Monogon, despite its appearances as a benefactor of humanity, has in fact trampled humankind to submission, using its crablet headset and void-powered simulation. Within the castle are a series of stained glass panels that appear to show Ford's journey, and several NPCs including zombie Fords, crablets, the Arena King, and Fantasyland Fords. Most interestingly, every picture showing what appears to be our Ford has a halo adorning his head that halo does not appear on the Arena King or Fantasyland Fords. Further inspection of one panel depicts Ford as one half with the other half made of a null body, and the two halves are slightly merging. The panel appears to be suggesting that null bodies hope to become Ford. The color palette and arrangement of the background of the window also suggest a spark of life theme, which ties in with the null body's sentience and emancipation motif that has threaded the game. One panel shows the king presiding over the construction of the castle. However, the way the panel is depicted suggests another emancipation theme. The king is atop his throne while his subjects toil away. In a nearby panel, Ford's struggle in arena combat. On the TV in the dungeon, an endless cycle of combat is shown for these Fantasyland Fords. Finally, when you defeat the king in the throne room, the Fords are eager for you to don the crown and become the new king. The other most eye-catching panel is one that depicts worship of the system clock by Fantasyland Fords. Closer inspection, shows a large yellow starburst-like pattern radiating from the system clock. Does this represent Ford's destruction of the system clock? Do the Fantasyland Fords view our Ford as some kind of savior? An emancipator, perhaps? Recall that all of the panels detailing Ford's journey 
show him with a halo around his head. It makes sense then that these Fords would worship the event that brings our Ford to them, the destruction of the system clock. Hopefully it's been made clear that we, the player, are experiencing just one iteration in a series of successful Fords to make it to the void. Perhaps the Fords in the dungeon and the throne room levels are aware of this cycle and worship it, because each iteration presents a chance for them to break free from their life of combat and labor at the boot of the king. However, there are so many unanswered questions here and very little to go on, so I will step away from this torrent of speculation and return to Ford's journey. After vanquishing the king, Ford finally reaches the goal of his quest, the throne room. Fantasyland, being an unfinished project by Stress Level Zero, still has many security holes and isn't monitored by the watchful eye and control found in Mythos City. Mike Hayes reaches out one final time. Dude, they found you in the old offices. I mean, like the physical world version of you. How are you even still in there? That doesn't even make any sense. I mean, technically the... Look, you gotta get out of there right now. Hayes is puzzled how Ford is still even reachable, given that Myth OS has been left in tatters in Ford's wake. It appears Hayes doesn't realize Ford has traversed the Boneworks in the fantasy land. Hayes abruptly ends the call when Saber Lake security agents pound on his door. Stress Level Zero has stayed true to their recklessness from Duck Season. Instead of merely using the Void Way to showcase their video game, they are now constructing Fantasyland directly from Void Matter. To facilitate this development, Fantasyland's throne room has within it a massive chamber with an apparatus for directly traveling in and out of the Void Way. Nearly every inch of the chamber is covered with warning messages. Turn back, keep out, stay out of the Void, do not open. Upon entering this chamber, Ford is contacted one last time by Alora. She isn't happy. She shows that she has found the game on the USB stick that ushered in the day's events. The transmission ends, allowing Ford to turn to a significant problem. The entryway has been blocked. Enormous concrete barriers are piled onto the voidway seal and the gravity hook is recessed and out of reach. Thankfully, Ford gets a helping hand from the mysterious entity, X. Nearby sits a dev manipulator and the message, you're welcome. The dev manipulator makes quick work of the barriers and seal and Ford leaps finally into the voidway. Oh, and there's a trickster monkey resembling misdirection sitting nearby. So... <laughs> The consensus is that crossing this threshold is the moment when Ford's body in the real world dies. All that's left is his consciousness and the vast expanse ahead. The voidway is immediately filled with the stuff of nightmares. Ford is surrounded by an onslaught of zombie Fords, crablets, and a new NPC, the King Crab. Ford battles his way into the darkness toward the few lights visible in the distance, leading to Chamber 2. I want to offer a clarification of the consensus idea that Ford is dead the moment that he crosses the voidway threshold, because a literal parsing of the specific quote from the break room muddies this idea. Theoretically, if we can somehow stop the system clock, we could disconnect the resurrection field outside Mythos chambers. We could resurrect in the void. The voidway could allow for immortality. Parsing it very literally, Ford claims that he could resurrect in the void after exiting the Mythos chambers. Technically, he has completed his exit from the Mythos chamber by crossing the threshold, but you don't undergo any death or resurrection in the game. However, thinking a bit deeper about Ford's other messages about minds being directly connected to the void suggests that crossing that voidway threshold has severed his consciousness from his physical body. So, for all intents and purposes, real-life Ford is dead. Our Ford has realized his goals and begins the climb to Chamber 2. Reaching the top of Chamber 2, Ford takes one final look at his real-world existence and gets confirmation that there will never be a way to go back. Saber Lake agents break through the door where Ford's body sits. We see the crowbar that our Ford strapped to his back in the earlier cutscene, confirming the separation of the real and virtual worlds. Once the room is cleared, an entity known among the lore hunters as Redacted Man enters. Given the nomenclature found in Duck Season references, however, this person, in my view, appears to be a G-Man. He acknowledges and gestures to the Void Fords, who have arrived to re-witness this moment. He turns, racks the slide, and squeezes the trigger. I hope you've enjoyed this Boneworks lore guide. I do not have answers or explanations for the G-Man, 
but I'm sure we'll hear more about him in future lore drops and games from Stress Level Zero. Thanks again to the Boneworks lore community for all of the helpful feedback and discussion that truly made this guide possible. I also want to especially thank Alex Knoll, the author of The Lore of Boneworks, a game for which I have happily volunteered literally hundreds of hours of my life, editing video guides and exploring its depths. It has been a joy. Finally, thank you, dear viewer, for tuning in.